Kia ora koutou, um, ko tapo anu uku te maunga, ko te waiwatu a te awa, ko takahanga me manga manu o kumarai, ko nai tahu te iwi, ko nga te kore te hapu, ko Chanel taka ngoi ngoa, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Right, so I'm going to be talking today about the research I did for my master's thesis. Um, I looked at distribution as well as trapping efficiencies and I conducted some feeding trials for Kekiwai, um, our native freshwater crayfish that we did have down here. So prior to undertaking this research, um, I knew very little about freshwater crayfish, apart from the fact that they're really nice, slightly sauteed in garlic butter and served with seafood dressing. So it was a really um, amazing learning experience for me and one that I thoroughly enjoyed. So. Why look at freshwater crayfish? So, no errors. Ah. Okay. Right. So, freshwater crayfish, they are a Taonga species, so they're a highly valued species for Māori. And for Māori, it's really important for us to be able to feed our manuhiri or our visitors or our guests from food that we can harvest and that we can get from our area that we live in. Um, this not only reflects the mana of the people that are there now, but it also reflects the choices of our ancestors, our tipuna, to actually settle in these areas. So they are culturally very significant species. Uh, this whakatauki is one of my favourite whakataukis, which is Toitu Timuraya Tane. So if the house of Tane, which is the god of the forest, if that and everything with it, if that persists, and toi te tamaraya tangaroa, if the house of tangaroa, which is our oceans, if that and everything within it persists, then toi te to iwi, then our people will persist. Okay, so kikiwai freshwater crayfish are also ecologically significant. They are a bioindicator species, so they're fairly tolerant to some stresses. However, they do indicate um, they do reflect on what's happening within the environment and um, when we're losing them we know that, that things are seriously wrong. They are bioengineering species, so they break down bits of debris and other things for other species to eat for uh, freshwater invertebrates, insects to eat. They bioturbate, so they turn over the sediments and they create habitats for other species. So they're very, very important in that aspect. They're also um, a very important prey species for us uh, prey species for our other animals like our tuna, our eels and our native fishes. Um, they are the mega fauna of our invertebrate species, so they're the largest invertebrates that we have. And most interestingly is that these are our only freshwater omnivores. So we have nothing else in our waterways that will, well naturally in our waterways, that will consume macrophytes. Now macrophytes are invasive weeds that are in our waterways and we've got quite an issue with them at the moment. So yeah, they are our only freshwater omnivore. So they're a very important species. Okay, so my objectives for my thesis was to map the distribution and abundance of the kiki wine. Um, I wanted to compare contemporary and traditional uh, capture methods. So I was looking at both active and passive capture methods. And I also wanted to compare food consumption and preferences. Now, Kikiwa are considered opportunistic omnivores, which means that they'll eat pretty much anything. However, I found in the literature it didn't actually go into detail as to what they actually meant by that. So um, I wanted to know, since we do have these invasive macrophytes in our waterways, um, is there potential for them to help as a biocontrol while they consume that? So I was looking, yeah, I was interested in looking at food consumption and their preferences for food consumption. So the first thing I did was I looked at distribution and abundance. So I went round to, I think, in total about 78 sites, and um, some of these I visited more than once, and um, I wanted to map the distribution to see if they were present or absent. Um, I was interested in the abundance and the population density, and I wanted to assess the population structure. So I wanted to know if there were adults, juveniles, males, females, and I wanted to know um, the size range of what we had within our streams and their life stage. So to do this, the first thing I did was I looked at the historical records from Niwa and had a look at where historically they'd been um, distributed. 
I um, read a lot of literature, Chilton 1888, that was quite interesting. Apparently we had quite a few freshwater crayfish in the Avon River, not just the tributaries, so they were abundant there, um, as well as in the Heathcote River um, around Papua Nui and other areas. Um, I also used anecdotal evidence, which I found quite interesting. I think that sometimes that can be very undervalued, especially as scientists, um, we, find it, we can find it quite challenging to use that kind of evidence. Um, but I found it quite interesting. There was one particular stream, Dudley Creek. Um, I was talking to a lady that when she was a young girl, so that we're not talking about a long time ago, um, she's young like me, but when she was a young girl, they were able to capture them in Dudley Creek, which is kind of like in, um, around Papua Nui area. And then, interestingly enough, I spoke to another guy that um, he remembers capturing them by the bucket loads in a um, stream in Marshlands. Now, that was actually the other end of Dudley Creek, so they were all along that stream. This is back in the like 50s, 60s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So, yeah, and the other way was interviews with local iwi. Well, um, I attended a tūnawananga at Taumutu, which I found quite interesting. I got to meet some pretty amazing people there. And what's really interesting is that um, you let people tell their story and they will um, just them sharing about what they had or what they saw when they were younger and uh, what they were able to take and then hearing about how things have changed and things have changed quite quickly, very dramatically, very quickly. Okay, so I want to do presence and absence something. So when I, I had a look at all these sites that <coughs> Niwa had looked at and other sites that I had been... Um, told about and um, assess the habitat to see if there would be potential for them there. Unfortunately, some of the habitats that had them um, going back about in the 60s, 70s, these actually, some of the waterways don't even exist anymore, so that was quite upsetting. And um, to confirm whether or not Kikiwai were present, we used spotlighting. That's a um, pretty well used um, method of determining presence absence for nocturnal animals and especially for freshwater crayfish both here and internationally. Okay so historical surveys. The thing with the historical surveys from Niwa is that prior to about the 2000s they mainly targeted vertebrate species so really what they were looking for were fishes and eels but if they did happen to see some freshwater crayfish then they would mark that down. So even though some of these sites didn't show that they had them, because they weren't specifically looking for them, they still could have been there. So I went back and had a look. Some of the sites where I had been told that they were, if I didn't see them the first time, I visited them multiple times to make sure that I wasn't going to miss them. However, in saying that, there is right around Styx Mill area, um, they've actually got a website where they show that they've got freshwater crayfish in there. We visited that site a number of times, I still didn't see them. So even though my results show presence and absence, what it actually does show is the fact that they could still be in these places, but that the populations have declined to the point that they're really, really difficult to detect. So in places where they used to be really abundant, they're very, very difficult to detect. So that kind of suggests that they are they're quite threatened. Okay, so in the survey that was done on the freshwater uh, fish database through NEWA. They used a variety of capture methods, so some of these were found or caught when they were um, spotlighting, some using GMNO traps, sometimes using um, electric fishing. So they used a variety of capture and survey methods. Okay, so when I went back and had a look, I had a look not only at their sites but a, a few more. Uh, in saying that there are some sites that are not on this map and that I have not included, and these are because these sites are um, of special interest to um, local iwi and um, it's their intellectual property and these sites will not be shared. But um, I have shared it with the people concerned and they know that they're there, which is that's what's important. These are places that they traditionally harvest from or places that are tapu to them. Okay, so I found that in all the sites I looked at, less than 20% I was able to confirm that um, freshwater crayfish were present. And only two of the sites from after 2000, from the um, Niwa database, was I able to find that um, freshwater crayfish were still present. And there was one site that was last surveyed in 1997, 
And um, when I surveyed it, um, I found that there were still freshwater crayfish present. In fact, not only were they present, they were the largest specimens I came across. So that was quite exciting. Okay, so what I did is I then grouped all the waterway and land use into different groups. As you can see here, the blue bars, they indicate the type of waterway. So we've got like a rural natural stream and the green bars show whether Kikiwai were present or how many sites showed that Kikiwai were present. So in our um, natural rural waterways, where I found I was able to confirm most presence, um, there were only a couple in what, I would, what I've called rural water races. So they're actually drains or man-made waterways. And um, the L, that stands for um, lakes, lagoons and ponds. So there was a couple in lakes, lagoons and ponds. I also looked at um, sites as far east as Lake Coleridge and um, I was able to confirm Kikiwai were present in one of the lakes out there. So in the suburban streams, there were a couple of natural suburban streams and I think there was only one in the suburban water race. Uh, there were none present in any <coughs> urban areas, which is unfortunate because that's where they used to be. Okay. Um, so the thing is that after finding out where they were, or if they were there or they weren't there, I really wanted to know what the population structure was. So I wanted to know if there was males, females, um, if there was lots of juveniles. So to do this, I had to be able to capture them. And I found with the spotlighting, that was quite limiting because the spotlight, you're actually in the water, sometimes you stir up the sediment so you would see them, but you couldn't necessarily capture them. So after looking at literature, some of the, one of the most effective methods used overseas is trapping. So I thought I'd give that a go and I looked at various types of baits to use. Okay, so the first time I trialled it, I went to the one site where I knew that they were quite, still quite abundant, and we set 18 gene minnow traps, and they were baited with, the first time with steak, uh, actually it was gravy beef, but with the kiki, I don't know that. So um, we set them with gravy beef. Now they're put into little wee um, film canisters, we poke holes in them, that's placed in the gene minnow traps, and hopefully it's fragrant enough to attract them. So the first night we set the 18 traps, the next day we came back, pulled them up, and um, we caught zero, zilch, nothing. Okay, so I thought, okay then, we will try kidney. So we chopped up kidney, put that in, set them overnight, came back, pulled them up, and we caught none. So then the third night, I thought, right, someone had told me to try cat food. So we trialled cat food. I placed down all my traps, Again, I pulled them up and I caught none. So I thought, right, I'll try liver because it's an awful, it should be quite fragrant, it's quite soft and mushy. So um, I got that all ready, I chopped it all up, ready to go into my traps and put it in a little wee baggie on the bench, right? Now, in science, we don't make mistakes, okay? However, sometimes we have these really amazing learning opportunities. And I was very, very fortunate enough to actually experience one of these. So I arrived at my site with my baggie of liver to place into my traps and discovered that I'd actually left my baggie of liver on the kitchen bench, which um, my cats were eternally grateful for. Um, so I had no bait, and I thought, right, I'm out here now. I'm not going to just turn around. So I thought, I'll try Gemino traps with no bait. So I set the 18 traps, and I went back the next day. Of course, there was no liver left. So I was going to try marmite. Now marmite's quite often used to attract freshwater fishes. Um, it's very, very effective here. It has to be marmite. These are kiwi animals. They will not come to Vegemite. Um, so yeah, they can, they can sniff out counterfeits. So it has to be marmite. So we went back the next day and we pulled up our traps. I said to my um, sampling accomplice, I said, right, um, we're gonna reset these traps with the marmite. It's okay, there won't be anything in there. And in total, we caught seven. So from a slight error, we actually found that unbaited g traps do attract kikiwai. However, because we had the marmite there, we thought we'd trial that. And we set the traps again, we pulled them up and we caught four. So we found that marmite and or no bait from that preliminary trial was the most effective. <coughs> okay, so 
I wanted to look at other different methods for capturing them. Like I said previously, they'd been caught with electric fishing, spotlight and hand net catcher. Um, also, there has been some studies done using traditional tokura, which I was really keen and interested in looking at. So to do this, we looked at three streams that we knew that Kikiwai were present, and we had them at approximately 100 metres per reach. Um, when I say approximately, there was only one that catered to my OCD where everything was, it was 100 metres and everything was exactly 20 metres apart. So um, I had six sampling stations along 20, approximately 20 metre intervals, used both active and passive capture methods, um, and used, but the passive capture methods used both baited and non-baited conditions. Okay, so the method order was randomly selected for each site. Um, this was done by using an opaque container that I placed all the names in and anyone that walked past my office door was dragged and dipped their hand in and pick out an order. Um, that worked for most people. I found that the biochemists were a bit more suspicious and they were less likely to actually dip their hand into something when they couldn't see it. But um, I did get some people that helped that were very cooperative and helped with that. The only method that I did use last was electric fishing. It was always done last and that is because it is the most um, intrusive method. Okay, and you'll see why. So for the active capture techniques, okay, we've got the traditional um, scientific method of the spotlight and hand net capture. Uh, yes, it can be quite effective, um, but as I said, when you stir up the sediment, it can cloud the water, so sometimes you can see them, but by the time you get to them, they're gone. Um, they run into the overhang or into macrophytes, and they can be very difficult to capture. Now, the electric fishing was very, very effective. Now, for the, those of you that don't know how the electric fishing works, right, you have this pack here, and you've got this wand. Now, this sends out a, a pulsed current, um, and then you've got your um, sampling accomplice here with the push net, and you go towards the push net and you pulse out this current, which um, will slightly stun the fish, will actually they swim away from it, so they swim into the push net where you can scoop them up and then you're able to capture them. Now, doing this, we did have some people stop off and they were you know, quite curious about what we're doing and they were kind of like, oh no, the poor little fishies, you're gonna fry the poor little fishies. And it's like, well, it doesn't actually work like that because the way that the, um, the electric fishing works is that when it sets out this pulse current, it's kind of like when you drop a stone in and you've got the rings. So an animal that crosses one ring is going to get only a slight shock or a slight stun, whereas an animal that crosses multiple rings is actually more likely to get more of a, a tickle, more of a buzz than a, a smaller animal. So it's actually, the smaller the animal, pretty much the safer it is. Okay, so that was quite effective. That was an effective method. So we use the G-mino traps, and these how these work. You can see the funnel openings here. The animals walk into here, they fall down, and they can't get back out. As you can see, it was effective. We did capture some. Um, now, fight nets. Now, this was quite interesting. It was like, why are we going to use fight nets? Well, I did some reading, and in Turkey, they harvest a lot of freshwater crayfish, and they used to use cray pots or, um, well, they called them cray pots, but they're very, very similar to our G-minos. They've got the two funnel openings. But what they found is that they found that fight nets were far more effective and they could harvest more than what they ever did from using the G-mino traps. So I thought, okay, we'll give it a go. So we used the fight nets. Now, as you can see, we only used three fight nets as opposed to the six when we were using the other traps. Now, this is mainly because, as you can see from the size of the um, G-mino here, it's probably not even quite filling the other cylinder of the other one. And with the fight nets, you've got this really long leader net so that goes along the bank, it guides the animals into the fight net, um, so that actually covers quite a big area. So it was kind of like three of them was the equivalent pretty much to six of the others, so that's why we chose to use the three of them. Unfortunately, fight nets also attracted um, bycatch, like these fellas here. So we probably could have potentially caught Kikiwai, but when we got back there the next morning, we can't really say if we did or not, because if they were there, then this fella would have eaten them. Okay, so the other method that I was really curious about was the tokura. Now this is a traditional method that our Māori have been using for generations. It's a way of harvesting kikiwai, and the way that this works is that the animals come in and they colonise what we call the tokura here. Now this is a bundle, this one in particular is a bundle of bracken fern, which is um, 
tied together, you can use kanuka and manuka. I did do some preliminary trials using kanuka, but I found that all the leaves fell off. So even though it did capture some, it did lose a lot of leaves. Uh, these were set overnight. Now usually these are set for a minimum of six weeks. Um, they can actually be left in situ for up to two years. So um, good potential as a monitoring tool. And you can keep pulling them up and relaying them. And what I found with this is that um, they were quite effective in both baited and non-baited conditions. And um, as you can see, uh, like this is what it looks like in the water. This is before it goes in, what it looks like in the water, and then we pull it up and we shake it out in the um, kikiwai fallout, and then we're able to measure them and sample them. Okay, so our results. So this is what we found. This is a generalised linear model, so what we've done is we've thrown everything together and what we did find is that there was quite a large effect, as you can see here, of reach. So we did capture a lot more animals at the Northbrook site than what we did at any of the other sites. There is a bit of um, difference between Geminosa and Tokura, the effectiveness between these, but generally the most effective method overall was the electric fishing um, and Gemino and Tokura were also quite effective. Okay, so for the size of the animals caught, the individuals caught, with the active capture techniques, spotlighting was really not very effective during this trial, but we found that with the electric fishing in the orange, we got a really, really nice mixture of sizes, so from the small ones right up to quite larger ones, which was really, really good. It showed no bias for size, so that was really interesting. When it came to the passive trapping methods, we found that we did have a bias with G minnows. We've got the baited conditions on this side and the unbaited conditions on that side. So um, but the G minnows, which are the triangles, we found that they tended to be more biased towards larger individuals. Um, a lot of the literature shows that they're actually biased towards large males. I found that there was no difference for sex bias, but there was differences for um, size wise, they were more biased towards larger individuals. Uh, I found that the tokura, bearing in mind that these were used only overnight and not for a minimum of six weeks, they tended to be quite biased towards smaller individuals. So there was a bit of bias using these methods. The fight nets, um, they really didn't register. Like I said, they did catch a lot of bycatch. Okay, so to summarise that, I found that electric fishing was indeed the most effective method. However, it's very, very limited by water depth. You cannot electric fish in water that is probably deeper than about here. Um, and also, because it, like when we pulled the push net together and we pulled it up, it also caught onto some of the macrophytes that were there and it dredged up a lot of macrophytes. So it's kind of like, is it really the electric fishing that was that effective or was it the dredging motion of actually pulling up the macrophytes? Um, so it does, it, is, it can be used, but its use is restricted. Spotlight and hand net catcher was the least effective method for active methods, uh, like fight nets was the least effective for the passive methods. The tokura was biased towards juveniles, but there is potential there for long-term monitoring. And the gemino trapping, that was biased towards larger individuals, but it is a good effective overnight sampling tool. Okay, so when it came to the tokura, I was really, really keen to know why they worked. Now we know that they worked, I mean, our people have used it for generations to harvest them, and they're not going to invest time in something that doesn't work. But I was curious as to know why did they work. Is it because it is a potential refugia for the animals, or is it because it's a potential food source? So to look at this, to analyse this, what I did was I did a three week and six week experiment. So I placed both artificial and natural tokura out for six weeks. Um, after three weeks we pulled up half of them, and after six weeks we pulled up the rest. And for the artificial tokura, we used these very innovative um, artificial Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. So these were like 40 centimetres tall. They weren't quite long enough for a tokura, so we put two together for length, and then I think in total there's about eight, so four of the bundles together, and these mimicked, well I think these mimicked quite nicely the natural tokura. Okay, so this is what we found. 
Right, so with, after three weeks, with the artificial tokura and the natural tokura, we find that um, there is quite a bit of variation, you can see by the error bars, but generally, um, the natural tokura pretty much caught twice as much as what the um, artificial tokura did, although it's just marginally significant. Uh, after six weeks, I found the six weeks one quite interesting because someone had stolen one of my, well, one of my natural tokura had um, walked away, so um, I had less to work with there, but we still find that we had double the amount of um, kikiwai than what we did with the artificial ones. So that suggests that perhaps it is more than just the refugia that attracts them, that probably it is potentially also because it's a food source. Okay, so what we found too was that, um, again, there were a lot of juveniles, um, but that could also be attributed to the time of year. Now, when I actually started conducting these experiments, it was when I finished my laboratory experiments, and um, so this was going more into the season when um, the females are actually releasing their young, which um, was shown because we did have a few that were less than... Oh, about three, they're only about three or four millimetres for carapace length, so they're just, they've just freshly um, been released from their mothers. But, yeah, as you can see, the, um, there was a lot more juveniles in the artificial than what there was in the um, natural tokura. But if you add the... There was no real, males and females were not um, significantly different, so they were pretty much the same. But if we add the males to the females there, you'll see that you got, get pretty much the same amount. So after six weeks in the natural um, tokura, you've pretty much got the same amount of males, um, I mean, of adults to juveniles. So I thought that was quite interesting. Okay, so the final thing that I was interested in looking at was consumption, you know, um, food trials. So, like I said, there's a lot of literature that um, says that kikiwai are opportunistic omnivores, and they are, but there's not really much detail as to what they will eat. So I was really, really curious, like a lot of our waterways have invasive macrophytes, um, like watercress, monkey musk, and oxygen wheat, and I was like, well, okay, so will they eat this? You know, it was basically, will they eat this? So that was what I did for my consumption experiments. I looked at um, macrophytes, um, detritus, again, will they eat this? And, um, and invertebrates. The invertebrates was interesting, I used the mayflies, well, mayfly larva, and um, snails. Now snails are protected, they've got armature, they've got a nice hard shell, so I was curious to see if they would be targeted as easily as what the mayflies would. The mayflies don't have um, the armature, they are quite a juicy looking little bug, so I thought that they'd be, um, for preferences in that, I thought that they'd probably prefer mayflies. Okay, so I was interested in consumption, preference, and the effects of body size on consumption. So these were conducted in the laboratory. Now, all the specimens I used were sourced from wild populations because I am interested in what they will eat in the wild. Um, we did have the opportunity to actually use farm ones, but I personally think that farm ones are probably institutionalised. They're used to being hand-fed, so they'll eat anything that they're presented with. Um, so, yeah, they were sourced from the wilds. They were then transported back to the university to our laboratory in these very high-tech transport containers. Um, they were all kept separate. They were put together in the same container, but all kept separate, and that was to stop them from... They can be cannibalistic, so we didn't want them eating each other before they arrived back. And all the experiments were conducted in these very high-tech experimental conditions. So... The experiments ran for 72 hours for each condition. I had five replicates for each condition um, in those two litre square containers. We had the crayfish, the food, and the PVC pipe for refugia was placed in each. Now, um, I would have liked to have had more than five replicates for each condition, but I was limited by that which I could capture. They weren't easy to capture, and like I said, I wanted to use the wild ones and not farmed ones, because I wanted to see what they're doing in the wild. And this is what I found for consumption. Okay, so we've got the watercress here. Um, as you can see by the error bar, there's not too much variation there. They pretty much all ate pretty much the same amount. Um, they ate the monkey musk. I was a bit surprised with that. That's quite coarse, fibrous, not very nice. But they did eat that. And again, all of them ate some of it. And the same with the oxygen weed. The oxygen weed was, um, appeared to be the most palatable in this part of the experiment. 
Okay, so with the detritus, I used three native and one exotic, but all of these plants, well one, are found naturally in the area where the animals were collected, but two, they're quite common in, around most of our natural waterways. So we have the Pittosporum, that was quite popular, not too much variation there, so they all kind of like that one. Now the Tikorka, that one did surprise me. I didn't expect them to eat that at all. Um, tikorka is it's awful. I mean, personally I know, my mother used to harvest this when I was a kid, um, and it is just awful. I've got friends that have said to me, if it's that awful, why would you eat it? And it's like, well hello, like, your mother fed you Brussels sprouts. Every culture's got them. Okay, that's our Brussels sprouts. But on top of that, it's also quite coarse and fibrous, and it's pretty hard to break up. I mean, as most of you will know, if you've ever tried to mow it, it's really, really hard to break up. So I really didn't expect them to eat that at all. But as you can see here, at least one of them did. You can tell by the huge amount of variation there with the Erebar. Um, there's always one, isn't there? There's always one. I didn't expect any of them to eat it, but yeah, there's always one. Okay, the broadleaf, another native that's found in a lot of our waterways. That was also quite popular, um, not too much variation there. Quite surprising with the willow leaves, so some of them thought it was really tasty, and some of them just weren't really that interested. So yeah. So then I looked at the mayflies and snails. Now because the mayflies are softer, I kind of thought that they'd eat most of them. Uh, but I found that, well they did eat a lot of them, but it was actually the snails. The snails were absolutely annihilated. In fact, there was only one snail left at the whole experiment. And I think that's mainly because that snail was floating at the top of the water and it was a smaller crayfish in there and he probably just couldn't reach it. So yeah, the, um, the shell, the armature for the snails wasn't a problem at all for them. They quite liked them, they found them quite tasty. Okay, so body size effects of consumption. So for this one, I looked at the, the number of mayflies and the number of snails that they would eat. Um, I had three size classes for the mayflies, so that was 10 to 19 millimetre carapace length, um, 20 to 29 millimetre carapace length, and 30 to 39 millimetre carapace length. Um, for the snails, I was able to get four different size classes. Um, again, I was limited by what I could capture at the time. Um, I did uh, run the mayflies prior to doing the, the snail one, and we were able to capture more when it came to doing the snail one, so that was quite fortunate. And they were in, um, again, in the two litre containers with the crayfish, the food, and the refugia. So, does size matter? Well, as you can see with the mayflies, the consumption of mayflies, We've got this nice trend here. The larger the animal is, the more mayflies they tended to consume. So there does seem to be that relationship with the larger animals, the more that they'll eat. Which is what you'd expect from a site, because they've got a larger foregut, so they can actually fit more in there. However, with a lot of literature, it says that um, larger um, crayfish are least likely to eat um, invertebrates, and it's usually juveniles that will eat the invertebrates, because invertebrates are really, really important for growth and development. So juveniles will target invertebrates more than what um, the larger animals will. But we do have this, for size ratio, we do have this really nice relationship here. So does size matter with snails? Not so much. So we've got here, the little fellas are eating pretty much just as much as what the big fellas are. We do have a couple here that um, obviously didn't eat that much. But in saying that as well, that could also be attributed to the fact that um, it depends on the life stage of the animal as to when they will consume. Like when they're ready to molt, they do not eat. So they stop eating for, I think it's up to 72 hours before they'll molt. And um, that could be one of the reasons why uh, they didn't eat as much. Uh, we did find that there were a couple that did molt at the end of the experiment. So they could have been preparing for that. So that could explain the two outliers there. Okay, so for the preference experiment, I really did want to do both within and between. However, um, we are limited with time with our masters and I only did have enough time to run the within groups design. So um, also, I was limited by what I could capture. Um, I caught fresh specimens every time, so they were getting to be a bit wary of traps and getting caught by that stage, I think. So um, I did a within groups design, so I presented them with two choices of macrophytes, um, or detritus, or the invertebrate foods. Again, it ran for 72 hours, five replicates of each condition, and the containers and the refugia and food choice in the crayfish in each. 
and this is what I found. Now this is quite interesting because in the consumption experiment, they were quite keen on eating the watercress. They found the watercress quite palatable, not so much the monkey musk. But when we did the preference experiment, they really didn't care. It was kind of like it didn't matter. It was whatever end of the refugia they got up in the morning, or because they're nocturnal that they got up at night, they just went for it, whatever was there. Now when you're first looking at what they've eaten, um, it looks like they've consumed a lot. I mean, like these are freshwater crayfish. It's not like they went to the school of fine dining. It's kind of like more like Cookie Monster Academy. They just rip everything apart. So it does look like they've actually consumed a lot more than what they have. But when you actually look at it, they have it. However, it does mean that they make good gardeners. So they are still very, very useful in that aspect in their streams. Um, again, here with the monkey mask. Here, like in the um, consumption experiments. They were really keen on the oxygen weed, not so much in the um, monkey musk. And the preference experiments, they ate a lot more monkey musk than what they did oxygen weed. So that was like, again, it's probably just whatever is available and if they're hungry. Um, and there was no difference at all between, really, between the oxygen weed and the watercress when that was presented. So with detritus, uh, with sorry, with invertebrates. Um, Again, no real difference there. However, like in the consumption experiments, they really pummeled the snails. In the preference experiment, they really pummeled the um, mayflies, but statistically, it wasn't really significantly different. And same again for detritus. So they don't tend to show any real preference. They definitely are opportunistic, so whatever's closest, whatever's available, they'll eat it. Okay. So the conclusions, obviously they're no longer as abundant as what they previously were. Uh, the trapping efficiencies did vary with the seasons and along the different sites that I used. Um, they're definitely omnivores and they will feed on whatever's available. And it's hoped that the results of this research will inform population restoration projects and hopefully we can, it can be used in um, management strategies and projects. Okay, um, acknowledgements. Um, Amazing people that helped me out with this. Um, really, really appreciate it. They were absolutely awesome.